Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're chatting about the importance of zoos and the challenges they face with special guests. Dan Ash, President and CEO of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums in Washington, D.C. Nick DeHaja, President and CEO of the Oakland Zoo in California. And Dr. Michael Atkinson, President and CEO of the Chicago Zoological Society and Director of the Brookfield Zoo. So thank you all for joining us. It's just great to have you. We're going to be having fun today talking about the real importance to conservation, to education, to connecting us with our natural world, that, that, that important, important role that zoos uh, 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 play. And, uh, you know, you, you all attract uh, 183 million visitors annually, right, Dan? Is that, is that about right? That's, uh, that's about right. And um, that's the amazing fact to me is that's more than all the attendance at all professional sports combined in the United States. So NFL, NBA, MLB um, combined, um, our members' attendance exceeds that every year. It's just, it's just so, so amazing. And, and you're kind of the glue, the facilitator, the resource for the entire sector. So, Dan, let's, let's uh, start off with you. Um, if you could comment on why zoos are so important, why is this, there's this tremendous fashion. We know we're sports crazy in this country. We're more zoo crazy than we are sports crazy. And, and can we convert that energy into saving our planet, into saving the biodiversity of this place that we live? Well, and, and that, that is really it. I mean, people love animals. I mean, we, we all know that. And, and, and what we also know is that people are spending less and less time in nature. And so um, we, we, uh, we hear about things called nature deficit disorder, right? So because we're increasingly urban creatures, we live in cities, we spend time indoors, we're increasingly looking into screens every day now. And, and even <laughs> Um, and so zoos and aquariums uh, represent an opportunity for people to make a connection to nature. And, and that's something that's increasingly valuable. It's rarer today. It's, a, it's increasingly rare. And places like uh, Brookfield Zoo and Oakland Zoo provide that opportunity for people to get out of their urban environment and, and visit a slice of nature and make connections with animals that are really kind of fundamental to our well-being as a species. And we're going to come back to some of the services that you provide. But Nick, let's let's go to you because you have the daily um, task of opening this facility to people. But when you close the facility, it's not closed, right? You have another phase because you have living beings that depend on you to be fed, to be cared for, and, and you have to keep everything running financially. So could you just talk, could you just talk a little bit, talk us through the day at your zoo, that 24 hour day that never ends, right? That, that just cycles through, the lights never go off, you know, everybody doesn't go home, right? So, you know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that, Mark, because I think the pandemic really brought that to light. People thought we literally shut the lights off and we all went home. But obviously, we have living beings that are there at the zoo. So you talk about the incredible animal care team that's there, the veterinary team, all of the support services. So, yes, you know, we're a business that operates for the visitors and our guests that come in. But once they go home, you know, we always talk about our animals live here and all of the deep care that's involved behind the scenes is so critical. So during COVID, especially, you know, all of us as zoos and aquariums, we're spending millions of dollars every month uh, just to ensure that our populations were thriving. And that was something that came to light during, during COVID. And, and it also changes the, the definition of a patron, right? The patrons are not only the humans that come in, they are the animals that live there. They need to be served, right? It's, it, it's not just about uh, selling soft drinks when people are thirsty and, and providing places for, for people who want to leave coats in, in, in particular locations and ensuring that the environment is safe for the human beings. It's also ensuring that the habitats are not only safe, but they also are not creating stress. They're not creating trauma, right? 
Well, I mean, you know, we talk about animals first in Oakland. It, that is essentially what we're about. It's about protecting these species that are ambassadors for those in the wild. You know, we as guests go home. So providing them complex exhibits and habitats, ensuring they have the right enrichment, ensuring they have the right care. You know, it is a 24 hour uh, job, as you mentioned. So it is critical for us that we take care of these beings uh, as ambassadors uh, as best as we can, uh, because that's what connects our visitors. That's what connects them to understand you know, what's really happening. Uh, it's a vital uh, you know, role for us to play. And that transparency is also really important. We talk about not just animals that are being born, but we talk about the life cycle and animals that are dying. And that transparency builds trust and that trust builds connection. Uh, and that's what's critical for us to thrive. And Mark, I think that was a hallmark during the pandemic. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were worried about members, you know, potentially failing, right? And, and what, how are we going to deal with this? Because it's not like a hurricane where we have a, a couple of day crisis where our members can all pull together and help a, an institution that's in trouble. They are all in trouble. Um, but we didn't have a single member fail during the pandemic. And we didn't, ha we didn't have a crisis where we had to be moving animals around because they all held to that uh, concept that, that Nick just mentioned, animals first. And they put the animals first during the pandemic because it, the, the, the zoos and aquariums are where they live. It's their home. And, and, the, and we're really proud that they really did live that, uh, that concept of animals first. And Dr. Mike, you come to this position from a really unusual and just wonderful place, right? You have built a career caring for, for animals that are, that are in our care. Um, just talk a little bit about your um, insight into how the environment of a zoo needs to be shaped and then uh, so, that, so that the animal's health is safeguarded and their psychological well-being. There's there's that there's that aspect as well. You see this in in whales and aquariums uh, in aquariums, uh, but you also see that uh, very very you know in the large cats and the large primates in the mm -hmm. uh, in in in, um, in these very even even the smaller animals. Right, stress has a physical manifestation. Talk a little bit about your work behind the scenes, mm -hmm. and then. And then this idea of having somebody with that background now running a zoo. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that that's one of the key points that we really um, want to impress on people is how much work goes on behind the scenes and caring for these animals and the devotion of our care staff and their dedication. Um, this last year, year and a half has been an incredibly difficult journey for uh, many of our animal care professionals and that, you know, they have continued to come to work uh, 24 seven uh, throughout this entire pandemic. And, you know, that is uh, a difficult thing to do. And it's, uh, it was difficult for us to make sure we were taking the right safeguards for our staff, as well as our animals. Um, while we were closed down for periods of time, um, our animal care staff was still here on a daily basis, uh, dedicated to these animals. And, we really put so much energy and focus into making sure that we are providing the absolute best uh, health care that we can for our animals, as well as taking care of their, their welfare and their psychological needs and doing everything we can to make sure that they stay as healthy as they can and also stay as, as happy as they can. And the animals in zoos today, um, I, I do feel very strongly are, are happy and they are doing well and they are thriving. Um, and, uh, you know, the same way that I know that my dog's happy to see me when I come home at the end of the day is the same relationship that most of our animal care staff maintain with the animals that they work with. And uh, it's a very special relationship and a very special bond between our, our care staff and, and these animals. And it uh, it really assures that we can keep these animals here for the purpose that they're here to act as those ambassadors uh, for their counterparts in the wild and to uh, instill a sense of conservation into our guests and our visitors. Mike, while we're while we're with you, could you could you uh, give us some insight? Uh, I'm just sort of tapping into your expertise as a veterinary uh, professional. Uh, three snow leopards uh, died of COVID nineteen at the Nebraska Zoo, um, and it just strikes me that you know 
in, in the run up while people were joining, I, I, I talk about COVID and I talk about the, the, the mm -hmm. uh, necessity of, of protecting each other, either through vaccinations, through masks or a combination of, uh, of both. Um, could you just talk a little bit about what, what the evidence says right now about transmissibility among species and um, in, particularly in zoo, in, uh, zoo environments? And uh, what, what are we as visitors to do? Uh, are, are we, are we um, transmitting a virus to, to animals um, by, by our behaviors? And it's a, a very big topic there um, in terms of, of the COVID effects in, in other animals. Uh, we know that many, many different species carry their own coronaviruses um, and that many of those coronaviruses can transmit between species. Uh, it was a coronavirus that came out of wildlife that was responsible for the initial SARS outbreak um, many years ago. And um, so we've been on edge from the very beginning of this pandemic of, you know, what is the possibility and the likelihood of this uh, virus being able to transmit from people back into animals um, where it may have health effects on those animals or they may act as a reservoir that reinfects uh, additional people. So from the veterinary standpoint, that's been very heavy on our minds from the very beginning. Uh, fortunately, this virus has not played it played out to be a significant risk to many of our companion animals, our dogs and our cats in our homes. There's been some isolated cases, but it really, you know, those animals do not seem to be playing any real part in this pandemic. Um, but from the zoo side, we obviously work with a wide variety of different wildlife species, and we know that, you know, there are risks of many of those animals uh, potentially being uh, capable of being infected. So from the very beginning of this pandemic, um, zoos have been working to, you know, keep their animal care staff in masks, maintain distancing from certain species as best as possible. Uh, we've closed some of our buildings down to public access so that we're not putting people in close proximity to, to some of the animals that we presume are affected. Um, early on, a lot of that focused around apes and monkeys and, and animals that were, you know, fairly closely related to people in the grand scheme. But what we've really seen play out in this is that it actually seems to be some of our big cat species and some of our other small carnivores. Uh, that are actually at some of the highest risk of developing clinical disease from from COVID. And um, as you mentioned, you know, this this played out in a very tragic way just within the last couple of weeks with three snow leopards um, succumbing to the virus and dying. Uh, but we've seen outbreaks in many other zoos around the country um, in their, you know, some of their carnivore populations and their big cats. Uh, we have fortunately uh, been able to work with Zoetis, a veterinary pharmaceutical company uh, that has put together a vaccine against COVID that is specifically targeted for animals. Um, they have a long history of working with other coronavirus uh, vaccines for other diseases in animals. So this was a very a good opportunity for them to be able to put something together in a fairly quick timeline uh, that we've been able to get into our animals. And most of the zoos in the United States are at this point um, either uh, have full vaccines into all of their susceptible species or are working down that pathway. Um, and that does seem to be helping uh, to, to keep our animals safe. Thanks so much, Thank Mike. You. And we, we can do our own our own part by getting vaccinated and, and being careful yeah. around animals. I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Nick. Yeah, I guess, Mark, if I can just jump in and, and what Mike just said is absolutely right. I mean, we are dealing with right now the downstream effects of, yeah. of COVID. So, yes, we are all vaccinating our animals, and we were fortunate in Oakland to be among the first to do that. But we all really need to be talking about the upstream effects of where this is happening and why. That's the Glasgow conversations around global warming and climate change. We're talking about uh, needing to talk about deforestation of lands. Mm -hmm the fragmentation of lands, I and mean, that's where it begins, and that's the reason we're in this situation. So as much as we're focused on the critical care today, not only of humans, but of the animals, uh, as conservation organizations strong, uh, we are also focusing on the, the upstream effects and being a part of that solution as well. Yeah. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. And let's let's uh, first we're going to go to you, Dan, and we're going to uh, let's talk a little bit about um, the zoo, uh, zoos. We got a we got a, um, a a question which actually feeds into this uh, whole topic. And that is the, the role of the AZA in, in accrediting uh, zoos and um, and 
um, ensuring that zoos adhere to a certain standards in terms of animal care, but also in terms of the educational program, the connection to Nick's uh, topic, which is the core mission of advancing a, a whole idea of, of conservation. Uh, so we got we got a, a, a prompt from John. John, thank you very much. Um, that basically says, please discuss the difference between AZA accredited zoos and aquariums and other zoos and aquariums. So could you just r- walk us through this whole idea of, of why accreditation, why adherence to standards um, are important? And there's some obvious reasons, right? Health and care of the animals and so on. But there are other uh, reasons as well. Uh, and the difference between accredited and non-accredited institutions. Yeah, so um, when you think about AZA, our, our, the foundation of our business is we're an accrediting organization. And, and basically, that means that you know, if you're among the 241 um, AZA accredited members, you're at the very top of the game in the, in the zoological profession. And, and our accreditation does put, put an emphasis on animal care and welfare, obviously, because our members live on that reputation of that, that they put the interests of animals first. And and when you go to one of our member institutions, uh, like uh, Mike mentioned, that you, you can you can be confident that those animals are happy, they're thriving, they're they're among the best cared for animals on the planet. And um, but also there are facilities that are in, that are invested in conservation. They're they're working to save animals in nature. And so the price of admission, or when you're when you're paying for a concession or buying something in their gift store. That, that money is going back into conservation. Our members are um, contributing by buying by buying that that Coke, by having that experience, by hosting that party. You are contributing as well. You're having fun. Right. You're you're quenching your thirst, but you're also contributing to the conservation and research mission and the care of those local animals. Yeah, in in 2019, our members collectively spent $230 million in direct support for field conservation, on the ground field conservation. That means that they're collectively among the world's largest investors in in wildlife conservation. And so it's a tremendous alliance of, of facilities that are committed to conservation and they're committed to education um, talking to people. So when they're when they're visiting our, our member facilities, they're learning about animals, they're learning about what's happening to animals in nature, and they're learning about what they can do about it. And so the, the concrete actions that they can take to make um, make the world a better place for, for all animals. And Nick, um, in terms of your audience and the shape of your audience, we just completed uh, our first poll. We have the second one going on. About 50 percent of the people said that they had they had visited uh, zoos in the last um, uh, year Um, and um, our audience skews older. So that's a pretty good number. Could you just sort of break down your your audience and. Let's talk about the practicalities of your audience mix and ensuring that you have programs that attract not only uh, the the little kids who are always running around zoos and are just fascinated by everything, but also people, uh, uh, young adults, you know, people who are going from high school and into college and perhaps young professionals, um, uh, uh, older folks, you have to actually shape um, programs that connect to these different audience cohorts. And, and in a sense, you are shaping the percentages in that pie of, of audience attendance. How do you do that? And, and what kind of programs do you have that attach to people of different interests, backgrounds, and ages? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great question. Obviously, our, our core audience is certainly families with young kids. And so historically, we've always developed programs for elementary school kids, uh, and rightly so, because our first task is to make sure that young kids just love and appreciate animals. It, it all begins with a love for an animal. And once that appreciation and love is created, then we can bring them along the spectrum. You know, it's no longer uh, about tails and, and stripes. It becomes more about ecosystems and habitats. It becomes about global warming. But we have expanded, you know, in Oakland, along with all of these zoos and aquariums, developing programs for teenagers, uh, as well as high school kids and and even seniors. So we can start talking about, for example, uh, you know, biology uh, of California condors, uh, a program that we have with bison, 
And this fascinating finding, this fascinating finding in in the California condors that they can uh, reproduce uh, without having without mating, right? This I was I read that I was it was it was just amazing. Could you just talk a little bit about about? Well, I mean, and that and that's the incredible research as well coming out of all of our institutions. Um, you know, we as zoos were right there to protect and save the California condors from complete extinction. And now as we are reintroducing them, and caring for them, that research that is developing, you know, coming out of San Diego Zoo, our partners and uh, across uh, really the, the, the states, um, you know, we're poised, right? We are the ones, as Dan mentioned, not only are we contributing hundreds of millions of dollars, but we in effect are, could be the last Noah's Ark of saving these species. And so our work critically, locally, you know, nationally, even internationally is what is protecting these species in the wild. You know, uh, Joe Kleiman just, just made a comment about your zoo, Nick. And he, he said a few years ago, Open Zoo opened its California trail exhibit, which features limited uh, selection of temple species in larger than traditional habits. Uh, traditional zoo, uh, zoo uh, habitats. Uh, I mean, um, and and he was asking, is this a trend that we're seeing in the in the zoo community of having a limited number of representative species, um, really in, investing in in uh, these ex, uh, ex, uh, exhibitions or a- exhibits that and experiences that provide a a sort of a guided. Uh, experience that transforms our knowledge as visitors. Uh, uh, and, yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, just just to comment on that, thanks for the question. Uh, you know, what's important to us is, you know, people think of us as zoos, but so often we are in many ways sanctuaries. We are uh, populations and animals that are living forever in our institutions. And so the care for these species, obviously, you know, size of exhibit is important, but the complexity of that exhibit and how we care for them. So oftentimes that creates the choice. Uh, More animals, less animals. How do we do this appropriately to give them and replicate the kind of environment that they would have in the wild? So there is a shift happening uh, across our industries. um, And and people, I think, have a lot of misinformation about what we do. Uh, So, you know, this is a trend that's happening, certainly something that we're pushing as well. Now, um, my, what, what, what I find to be interesting is that you're coming in from an animal care perspective, but you also have professionals who are uh, really focused on the educational experience that is being conveyed. Could you talk a little bit about how, on the one hand, you're caring for animals, but you're also using the interaction between human and animals as Nick is in this particular exhibit that uh, Joe uh, Kleiman referenced. Um, you're you're using that experience to create a connection and to transform knowledge. Could you talk a little bit about the staff that you have, the team that you have, that specializes in that aspect of uh, zoological uh, management? And I'm going to go over uh, to uh, to Dan. Dan, we're going to have you comment on the various education programs that are offered and and how those connect across the nation, but. Uh, Mike, could you just talk a little bit about your team yeah. of specialists who have different competencies than you do? Yeah, I think that that's it's an excellent question. Um, you know, our staff is very diverse um, in their backgrounds, and and we're able to utilize that to make those connections with people in different ways. So, you know, that spans all ages from early childhood education professionals that are able to engage uh, kids in sort of a nature play based setting to get them into that natural world to make those connection with animals all the way up to some of our older audiences that um, attend, you know, evening lectures, lunchtime chats, uh, zookeeper interactions, where they're able to make that connection with a a person who has direct care of the animals and can talk about uh, the animals in a very uh, different context and on a very personal level of their interactions with the individuals that they work with. Um, you know, today we, we are able to provide better medical care for the animals at a zoo than billions of people around this world receive on, on for themselves. And, and I think that's a really powerful message that, uh, you know, resonates with people is the extent to which we are able to go to keep our animals healthy. 
with that, our animals live longer than they do in the wild. And we start seeing development of the same geriatric issues that we see in people. You know, our older animals develop arthritis, they develop cataracts, they develop heart disease, kidney disease, you know, all of these same things that we see in older people, we see today in our animals. But that is an opportunity for us to also engage and connect people and to tell those stories and share the, the level of veterinary excellence that we can provide for our animals. And we can also bring that back to our own experience, right? If, yes. if, 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 if we are finding that through that animals that don't exercise develop certain uh, diseases, for example, or that animals that live in stress, in stress develop certain conditions, right? That comes back to us because we're also animals. Exactly. Now, can we, can we talk a little bit about, the various uh, areas of expertise that are required um, uh, of, of really high functioning zoos, because the actual uh, range of experts, right? You not only have uh, veterinarians, you say you have the, the medical care, you have yeah. uh, other uh, habitat uh, um, creation, right? You have a yeah. stagecraft of staging these, these, these habitats. You have, the whole issue of of the nourishment, you have education of audience, you have patron service, mm -hmm. then you have back office stuff like financial <laughs> management and all that. Yeah, we, we say it's a village. I mean, it, it really in many ways, you know, the zoo is a village of people with different backgrounds, everything from our marketing and advertising teams to our IT support, to our security, to our business management offices. Um, on the display side, we have specialists that fabricate the habitats that our animals stay in. We have PhD level researchers that work on nutrition, reproductive physiology, a uh, variety of other, you know, uh, internally focused scientific research programs. And then we have the whole, uh, you know, external host of conservation minded folks that do the field science, that work with these animals in their native ranges, that provide habitat protection plans, that develop uh, species reintroduction programs all of these different backgrounds coming together that are all really focused on this singular mission of inspiring people, connecting people to nature, protecting wildlife and wild habitats, and helping people to just have fun. We all learn better when we're having fun. You know, if, if you're enjoying what you're doing at the zoo, it doesn't feel like learning. And, and that's the ideal environment for people to really have that eyes wide open uh, mindset to where these conservation messages can really take hold and to, to help people change behaviors. And that, that's, uh, go ahead. That's, that's a difference, you know, that people know a difference between a great zoo, you know, and a good zoo or a bad zoo. You know, and, you can, and the things that, that Mike and Nick have been talking about are the differences, right? When, when you're accredited by the AZA, that means you're you're you have education, you have conservation, you have guest service, you have solid financials. And so Brookfield Zoo has been an AZA member for decades. Oakland Zoo has been an AZA member for decades. They maintain a standard of excellence day in and day out. Um, and so that's the difference between an AZA accredited uh, facility and, and one that's not accredited. You're seeing the very, very best and you're getting the very, very best in return. And, and you mentioned education. And I just want to say that, um, that one of the great things about our member zoos is they're, um, they're democratizing access to nature, right? The um, access to nature, you know, for a long time has been uh, for the privileged, um, and, you know, if we said that if you want to see an elephant, go to Africa and see an elephant, that means that some fraction of 1% of people would have that privilege. Um, um, and, you know, if you were growing up on in here in Anacostia on the other side of the Anacostia River in Washington, what's the chance you would ever see an Asian elephant? Um, probably pretty small, but you can get to National Zoo. Um, and you can see an Asian elephant, you can see a panda bear, you can, um, you can see animals that you would never have the opportunity to see. And so what our members offer is really a, an, an equality in access to nature um, that is increasingly important today. So um, I'd like to stay with you, Dan, and then go to Nick. 
Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the technicalities surrounding accreditation, because one of the things that's fascinating is how accreditation actually works. It's not a top-down process, right? It's an inside-out process. It's members helping members. So could you talk about your accreditation team and your accreditation process from the point of view of the administration of accreditation? And then, Nick, could you talk about it from the, from the point of view of participating in that process both as an accredited organization, but also as a resource to AZA accreditation. Uh, Dan, let's start with you, and then we'll go over to Nick. Yeah, so the um, so it's it's a self-regulatory process, right? So our members agree um, amongst themselves to the standards, and so the standards are developed by by our board of directors. Um, um, and our policy staff, they're we in doing that, we consult with our members um, and we're dedicated to the, it's dedicated to the concept of constant improvement that we, our standards are continually evolving, improving as we learn more, as Michael said, as we learn more, we, we can do better. Um, and we, and we acknowledge that. And um, so we have an independent accreditation commission, 15 commissioners, um, who operate independently. I don't get a vote. Um, our board of directors doesn't get a vote. Um, our members are, are subjected to the standards. Um, they're required to go through accreditation every five years. Um, they are visited by an inspection team, usually about three to five uh, people, um, usually visiting the site for two to five days, depending on the size of the facility. They go through every portion of the facility, um, you know, top to bottom. They talk to employees. They talk to boards of directors. Um, they talk with guests um, uh, to get a full knowledge of what's happening at the facility. And and um, and the, the the accreditation commission, as I said, acts independently. They make the decision about whether a facility meets the standards or or doesn't meet the standards. And uh, um, and so it's a it's a rigorous process of review. And Nick, when when the accreditors arrive, is is there is there a welcoming uh, sense or a sense of dread? <laughs> how is that? How is that that unfold? Well, you know, I, it's a, probably a little bit of both uh, on the staff <laughs> side, on the management side. Um, uh, you know, I, I would say, yeah, it, it is such a rigorous process uh, that we go through, but. You know, I will tell you with technology today, it feels like we're getting accredited by our guests every single day. Um, you know, they are telling us on Great social point. media what we should be doing, they, whether we like it or not. And people don't hold them. back, right? People, that, I will, that's for sure. People don't hold back. So, you know, <laughs> you know being part of the AZA, uh, of the highest standard that exists is, is incredible. And our guests respond to that. They know that, you know, we are doing things really well. Certainly amongst the 240 accredited institutions, we're constantly sharing information uh, about what we're doing, what we're learning. And that's the, the beauty of the AZA and the camaraderie. You know, we're not competing with each other. We're all in this together. So from an accreditation standpoint, yes, we sweat a little as, as we should. Um, uh, but, you know, it's that connection and that interconnectedness to each other that becomes really important. And so, you know, it's an opportunity to not not worry about it, but to thrive on it and to learn from it and to, to be the best that we can. So, you know, um, we're going to we're going to go uh, to you, Mike, and then we're going to we're going to end up uh, with Dan because we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, we, we completed two polls One we we asked about uh, learning about conservation. How do you mostly learn about wildlife con conservation. We found 25% said uh, zoos, but most people uh, uh, were talking about uh, watching uh, 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 conservation documentaries, uh, shows like Nature, the uh, David Attenborough's um, uh, amazing series. And, and, um, and then we also asked about the values of zoos. And then what was interesting is that 60% of people said that it's conservation research, mm -hmm. habitat protection, and so on. So you have this really interesting side, which is learning zoos sort of, but not so much. But in terms of, of the value, it's really in conservation. Is there an opportunity here, Mike, to, uh, to uh, uh, provide a in-person experience 
that is even richer? And what are you doing to uh, think into the future of that in-person experience? Because we're so overwhelmed with our with our devices and our electronics and our screens and so on. But people are saying that they're still learning mostly about this through screens. Is there are, are you evolving your programs in ways that make that in-person experience even more enticing? And I think that, you know, it, it's an interesting thing because we all learn from these nature documentaries. We, we all watch them. And I mean, you're watching a 30 second clip of a video that, you know, may have taken four weeks to actually get that 30 second charismatic shot that, you know, provides that powerful message. And, you know, it's a, it's a great thing. We all learn from that. But there there is no replacement to seeing some of these animals up close and, and having those emotional connections to them in the moment. The challenge for us is reconciling those two things and, and being able to adapt our, our media efforts to where, you know, you are looking at the animal in person, but you're also able to see that video screen that's showing that amazing behavior that the animal can do, or, um, you know, being able to, to have an app that's alongside you as you walk through the zoo. And I think that's where, you know, zoos are really evolving a lot and we're doing it quickly in terms of figuring out how to mesh this digital world that we all live in with the actual animal right there in front of you and, and how we utilize our staff and our educational efforts to, to help people make that emotional connection that is so powerful for people um, and to reconcile that with this incredible digital realm that we all live in today um, and the material that that contains. So I think it's absolutely an opportunity. It's just a great, it's just a great answer, right? This whole idea of, of making knowledge more instantly accessible yeah. using uh, different tools. Dan, we're going to give you the last word. Um, what is the future of zoos? How do we evolve these institutions to continue this, this audience engagement and, and then allow us to, to, to actually take action um, through this experience? Well, I think I'll, I'll, I'll begin or, or end where we began, Mark, and say, you know, I think the future of a modern accredited zoo is extraordinarily bright. Um, people love animals. Um, they're coming to our members in increasing numbers. We're seeing that, you know, a post-pandemic surge in visitation, really. And so um, people are anxious. They're, uh, they, they want to, to be close to animals. Um, and, and we have the opportunity to help them do that in a respectful, you know, ethical, um, important way. Um, and we have the opportunity to engage them in the lives of those animals and their, their relatives in the wild and, and teach them about how they can engage in conservation. And we can have the opportunity to do conservation and to really help save animals from extinction. So Modern aquarium and zoo, the, I think the future is incredibly bright. We've learned a lot during the pandemic. Um, we've evolved our business models. We just talked about online. Our 183 million visitors um, here in the U.S., you can multiply that by several, you know, several orders of magnitude in terms of their digital reach. Um, um, more than one time during the pandemic, I had someone say to me you know, on a Zoom call, oh my God, thank you so much for Tell Cincinnati Zoo. Thank you so much for their Safari, Facebook Live Safari. It gives me an hour every day. My kids are glued to the TV. Um, and so I think our, our ability to reach people, not only at the zoo or the aquarium, but you know, through an online audience, incredibly important in, in today's world. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all. Dan Ash, President and CEO of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums in Washington, D.C. Nick DeHasia, President and CEO of the Oakland Zoo in California. And Dr. Michael Atkinson, President and CEO of the Chicago Zoological Society and Director of the Brookfield Zoo. Thank you so much. Thank your staffs. Thank your donors. Thank your members. And everyone, visit the zoo. Have a great day, all. Thank you, Mark.